Hi guys, it is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous spring day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization. It is May Day, May Day uh, 2020, and this is Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles, and, and, and guys, uh, I cannot think of a better way to sign off of Collapse Chronicles than the interview that I am getting ready to have with this man, Bill Gady, G-A-E-D-E. -E. We're going to go all the way over to Germany, and we're going to talk to uh, Bill Gady uh, about how humans are going to go extinct in the 21st century. We're going to start with some of his uh, wacky theories about human extinction and then in the first half and then we're going to close with actually talking about the corona panic one more time on my way out but uh bill i don't know how to define this guy i to call bill gady a physicist is to call sancho panza my dog a a a, a I, I, I don't know a coyote uh Bill Gady has his fingers in so many, uh, so many pots, guys. But we're going to go over to the the doomsday prophecy eschatology side of Bill Gady's brain uh, for this uh, for this interview. So, Bill, come on and say hi, and we're going to see where this conversation takes us. Hi, uh, Sam. Long time no see. <laughs> Yes, yes, I was surprised. Uh, I was surprised that you told me that last uh, interview was three years ago. I couldn't remember. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, guys, you might as well know it now. That other channel, that guy on that other channel, uh, inter interviewed Bill. I guess it was two and a half years ago. And, and, and Bill, I got a big apology to make. I, I'm going to make an admission and an apology. This is very rare that Sam Mitchell admits he was wrong and apologizes for it. During that interview, which I thoroughly enjoyed, I, I, I thought you were joking, brother. I could not tell if you were joking or if you were just some garden variety whack job. And as far as I was concerned, it was a very entertaining interview, but I didn't pay you any attention. I didn't pay you any attention. I went on believing uh, with the uh, what I call the Derek Jensen model that the global industrial economy and global industrial civilization is a threat to this planet. And I still believe the Derek Jensen model. But here's where what you have done for me, brother, is I actually, up until a few weeks ago, was suffering the delusion that bringing down the global industrial economy and, in effect, global industrial civilization was going to be a good thing for our fellow earthlings. That this was going that this was going to be the best thing we could do. Well, we did it a few weeks ago, and guess what? You were right, brother. You have proven to me that bringing down the global industrial economy is the single fastest route to, uh, if not human extinction, at least every one of our fellow earthlings going into the stew pot. So I'm making an, a public apology to Bill Gady. Do you accept my apology, Bill? Yeah, of course. Uh, I want you to know something, Sam. Okay. I've been beaten up for 20 years now on this <laughs> issue. I was the, uh, always a lone man here fighting everybody on, on the, the issue of extinction. Because no one really believes that man can become extinct. We have intelligence. We have the ability to have foresight. We have uh, uh, intelligence. And we can fix any problem, according to a lot of people. And so people have a hard time believing that we're on the Titanic. <laughs> well, you'll find a few more people down in this rabbit hole believing it. it just it, They're just broadening their horizons, I think, of how this can happen. So anyway, guys, I'm going to post that interview uh, from two and a half years ago with that other fellow from that other channel because I have nothing to lose at this point. I strongly you would advise you to go over there because we're going to have to fast forward and skip through the first 22 minutes of that hour-long interview. And uh, But where I want to pick up, uh, Bill, is what is the common denominator 
when you look at all of these past uh, mass extinctions, what is the common denominator, the obvious common denominator tying them together? And how does that uh, look like it's going to play out for our own species and our fellow earthlings here over the next few years or decades? So let's pick well, up there. Well, in, in a nutshell, in a nutshell um, plants disappear periodically, okay? Uh, there were three major, um, at least uh, three major ones that we can uh, put our hands on with, safely, and that's the era of the ferns, the era okay, of the Okay, let's the make this a nutshell, Bill. I, I, uh, yeah, yeah, I, this I, is very interesting back. information. I, 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 I make it a quick back. nutshell, okay. And, and, and then we have the, the era of our, uh, the mammals, which is the flowering plants. And the point here is that all mass extinctions happen right at the point where food disappears, where, the, um, where, where what the animals got used to after millions of years, uh, the herbivores, uh, the plants disappeared, the primary production disappeared, and with them disappeared the uh, carnivores. And we have the same situation today. Uh, right now what's going to disappear are the plants that we eat. And the reason they're going to disappear is that uh, we produce them artificially today. In other words, we produce them simply because of money. And when money goes away, which is uh, my theory, uh, then food goes away, just like with the dinosaurs and the synapsids and the, thrice, um, uh, the uh, uh, archosaurs and so on. So all these animals disappeared when their food disappeared. We're going to disappear when our food disappears. It disappears because money disappears, and we need money to produce food. Okay, so the, the common, as, you, as you've written here, and we are the last generation of humans on Earth, the common denominator of all mass extinctions is starvation. By definition, a mass extinction is the disappearance of an entire food chain, and we're going to talk in the second half when we get into the corona panic about all of these farmers plowing under their fields and uh, killing their chickens and uh, dumping their milk and, and not being able to find anyone to harvest this summer. We're going to get in that in, 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 in later on in this as a specific example, but, 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 but flesh this out for us so... It's the it's the economy. It's not going to be in your uh, your, your worldview. It's uh, it, it's the it's going to be a global economic collapse a lot sooner than any environmental collapse that is going to bring down this planet. It is going to be the economic collapse is going to lead into the all the other collapses that make us. And our fellow Earthlings extinct. Is that is there? We understand each other on this. Yeah, in general, uh, that's what's going to happen. In other words, uh, you can't have, as I, you know, said for now for twenty years, you can't have more and more unemployment, right? And uh, and have more fewer people who work uh, maintaining uh, an army, a growing army of people who don't. And that's when at some point, you know, there's there's a magical level at which money has no value because money is essentially being created to pay salaries. That's what it is. And if you can't make it to the end of the month with uh, with what they give you, if whatever they give you is only like 95 percent of what you need to stay to the end of the month to make it to the end of the month, then at that point, you know, it's not even useful to go to work. Why are you going to go to work to get 95 percent of what you need? And uh, I think that we're approaching that point. I think the, this virus simply accelerated uh, the process a little bit and made people think about that possibility. But we're headed in that direction no matter what. Yeah, we were, as I say, for the, for, for the, the first part of, our, uh, of this conversation, pre pretend like we were having this conversation like an ancient history uh, of like two months ago. And, we, and you and I had never heard of the coronavirus, and, and we were having this conversation completely unaware uh, of, of, of this little uh, black swan, the BS uh, <clears throat> event, and uh, you know, looming that we hadn't seen yet. So, even without assuming this had never shown up, where were we 
three months ago, two or three months ago, just sitting around waiting for the black swan to fly in? Even if the black swan did not come in, or the crow, or whatever, yeah, the crow. <laughs> uh, even if, if even if that didn't happen, we were on our way. And let me tell you why, Sam. Okay. Um, uh, services, which is what we have, uh, for example, the U.S. economy, eighty percent of it is services. Services is known as unemployment. Services is mass unemployment. Why? Because uh, let's say you have God's eyes, right? You're, you're up there in the heaven. You can see the, the entire earth, right? What do you see? Well, you see buildings. You see skyscrapers. You see houses. You see streets, highways. Uh, you see fields of corn. You know, this is what you see because that's real. Now, do you see transactions like financial transactions? Do you see insurance? No, you don't because insurance is a promise, and uh, uh, your bank account, that's a promise, too. So when you look at service, it's, uh, I think, all of it, but maybe I'm missing, you know, maybe some of it qualifies, like maybe haircutting or uh, uh, landscaping might qualify as something a little more useful. But it's all promises. All, all of financial world is just promises. And all we have are contracts and promises, what, what we're going to do in the future. You can't see that with God's eye. What you see with God's eyes, if you had them, is what, what we constructed, what we made, what we have. We have the cars, we have the boats, we have the airplanes. You know, those things you see. <laughs> but uh, you can't see the promises. And that's the problem with services. Services is mass unemployment. And uh, if, if we're going to put a number to that, if the United States has 80% services, we have 80% unemployment plus all that unemployment we have from retired people, housewives, students, etc. And, and so th 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 this was all uh, all coming around anyway. I really like how you e e explained uh, th this. And, and, this and, and, and our last interview, I was talking about your vision. Whether is, is this going to be a, a stair step? Uh, you know, uh, where we fall down and then recover and fall down and, uh, and or is it going to be over the cliff? And I think your, your description was it is going to be we are going to spiral downward until we get to the cliff. Are, <laughs> are, are, is that still your... Is well, that no, let, let me see if I can clarify that. Okay, uh, for clarify example, that. I think that in a couple of weeks, two, three, four weeks... Within that time frame, probably, they're going to let people go and go to work, and they're just going to put some new rules. And the politicians, all politicians all over the world, right, they'll say, hey, you know, uh, we're back to the normal. Uh, we're, everybody's happy now. Let's go back to work. And uh, we finally went over the hump, et cetera, et cetera. That's not going to happen. you got 26 million people right, so then. far in the United States which are officially unemployed, right? They're receiving government checks. And uh, yeah, what's the problem right. with that? Well, the problem with that is suddenly the U.S. government has two, has put into circulation $2.2 trillion. That means that what that does is that devalues the salary of a worker. Yeah, okay, we need, I, I, I want you to, okay, I, we're, we're, just please hold off for about uh, 15, 12 or 13 minutes. I'm, I, I'm, I'm trying there's, it's very hard to separate these two things, but we are. Yeah. I, I want to get the general framework of your theory. Then we're going to look at what is unfolding now. So, but no, you, the general, but two months. Remember, picture. we were having this conversation, this part of the conversation, in uh, on February first, not May first. So on February first, would you have said? We are in a downward spiral, waiting to get to the edge of the cliff for the final plunge. Well, again, yes, I, I would say we we've been at that um, in that trend for many years. Why? Because we're creating more and more services, which is unemployment, and by doing so, we're not we're not creating employment. We're 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 being uh, we're being uh, blindsided to the fact that we're creating unemployment. And the virus, if anything, just accelerated that process, made it more visible to people. Yeah. Okay, so 
we need to, before we move in, in, into the virus, this whole part, which I really had to go listen to my own interview with, with uh, you again to, 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 to really try to understand what you're saying, that uh, the, the collapse of the food chain you're not uh, uh, you're not looking at climate change and and, and all of that stuff right now. You are looking Absolutely at, at farmers uh, when when farmers no longer have an economic incentive to grow our food, they're going to stop growing our food. So if you're depending on a, a, a farmer to grow your food in the global industrial economy to find a way to get that food from his field into your mouth, this is what is going to break down. It's the, the, the economic collapse. It, when, when it reaches the point of food producers, that's when all hell breaks loose and Mad Max is here. Is that pretty much what you're saying? <laughs> Yeah, and keep in mind one thing also in what you just said. Uh, only 1% of the U.S. workers and 1% of GDP is agriculture. And that's what keeps us all alive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we got a very few, very few people and very few income maintaining, uh, 1% maintaining the 100%, in other words. Yeah, and so it, it, it all gets down. So, what are your what are again? If we were having this conversation on February first instead of May first, and then we'll bring it up uh, on February first, what were the triggers you were looking at that could make money quote disappear to the extent? That, that that farmers just said to hell with it. Uh, there, there's no nothing in it for me. I, I mean, I might have a garden for me and my family, but the rest of you, what were those triggers? <clears throat> well, uh, uh, keep in mind one thing here. I was looking at another indicator and uh, not the food itself. What I was looking at was the global um, growth rate. In other words, what is the global economic growth rate for everybody. You were talking yeah. about China, mm -hmm. Europe, everybody, you know? Yeah. And and I, what I was seeing is that that number was getting smaller and smaller uh, over, you know, if you look at it over 50 years, uh, that number became smaller and smaller and smaller. And this means that at some point we would have hit a plateau. Uh, we would have approached the asymptote yeah, as far as growth is concerned. At some point we would have reached zero growth, zero economic growth worldwide, and that would have triggered, that would have triggered, you know, a uh, deflation spiral, okay? And that's more or less uh, what I had in mind. What the virus did, if anything, is by coming in, is accelerate the process that was, uh, I think, going on anyways. And again, that is that more and more people were coming out of agriculture and manufacturing and going into services. So you had more and more what I call unemployment, I call services unemployment, and, I, and superposed on top of that, we had no gro global economic growth. Yeah, uh, okay, so uh, I, just, uh, well, well, j j just to sum up this part of the conversation, then we're going to start analyzing the corona panic. So j j just to, to, to sum up for the folks, a, a global economic collapse from whatever the trigger was going to be that we've just been sitting around waiting for is going to uh, eventually make make the just the idea of money a joke and and, and when <clears throat> the the ultimate the concern is when the the food producing uh, part of the economy, which is a pretty slender thread, as you as you're saying, when it goes, that is when uh, starvation gets, and people are going to, uh, you know, when, when they're getting, when they get hungry, they're going to start looking for something to eat. And so, before we get into this, I want to touch on one more thing, and then that. And my previous video, how when we stopped talking about humans 
and started looking at our fellow earthlings, well, when people no longer have money for whatever reason to buy food, obviously, who are they going to start looking to? If they can't look to people, other people, to give them money, uh, they're going to start looking, you know, for the zebra in the unprotected <laughs> national park down the street. Or they're going to start looking at that fat little Pekingese uh, next door. And it, we're literally, once this hits, we're going to literally eat every one of our fellow earthlings if we can't if we can't buy our food we're going to go out and get it the way we did the first 200,000 years but we're going to have 8 billion <laughs> of us doing that do the math absolutely absolutely <laughs> so I'm doing yeah, that's the idea the, the idea is that you know uh, you can imagine this happened to the T-Rexes as well when they couldn't find any food you know, then they started eating each other, and right. we're going to end up pretty much in the same boat. Uh, first, we kill whatever's out there alive, and the next step will be killing each other, killing your neighbor, the one you, who, who gave you a cup of sugar yesterday, now you're going to have to kill them. <laughs> <'em. laughs> well, 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 yeah, I mean, I mean, playing this out, you know, if, if, if it was, if, if there were, <laughs> what, a hundred million people on the planet or, or whatever is one thing, but eight billion people. Uh, I, I, I mean, clearly, I, I, I mean, is, is any, is any uh, gazelle in Uganda uh, getting, uh, uh, sleeping with, with, with both eyes closed tonight? It, it's going to be a it, it's going to be a feeding frenzy on on, on on this planet. And as you say, who are we going to eat after we've eaten every gazelle and every zebra and every gorilla in in Africa? Who the hell do you think we're going to eat? You know, let, let me let me say something that you know that came to mind because uh, a lot of people say. Well, you know, uh, the, um, there are lost tribes out there that don't belong to the global economy. You know, they do hunter-gathering yeah. still. And, you know, I was in the Amazon uh, River, uh, in the Amazon jungle there, a uh, little town called Leticia in Colombia. Uh, the three, yeah, yeah, yeah. three cities meet there. Yeah. Anyways, you go there and you find these Indians and they live uh, quite prehistorically. You know, when you visit their villages, etc., you, you go with a tour guide. And it turns out that, you know, these people are really uh, are not that, uh, uh, you know, far back in time. They have antennas coming out of their yeah. huts. That's yeah. one issue. The other issue is that, you know, they go to the city. They do have contact with, with uh, the white man, for the, the, so, to, so to speak. And uh, it turns out that, you know, uh, even in, you take any tribe that is really, really backward, uh, what we're going to be doing is killing whatever they killed, if, if they ate uh, boars, we're going to kill those boars, yeah. and then we're going to kill them. Yeah, so, they'll, they'll so be those the first lost tribes yeah. are not going to be off the hook because they're not part of our economy. Yeah, they'll be the first humans we eat. Uh, yeah, that, that's, exactly. Uh, and this is, guys, I know people listening to this, listening to the two of us talk, thinking we're a couple of loudmouth jackasses. Uh, and, and, and that we're that we're basically crazy. That this is never going to happen. But uh, what I've seen in, in the last few weeks, so, okay, we're going to use this as as, as our segue. Okay, uh, we're going to now move our our conversation from February first to May first. So. I, I might as well go out uh, with a bang here instead of a whimper at, at Collapse Chronicles. So I was listening to your video from March 15th uh, last night. Uh, the video you made on March 15th trying to figure out what the coronavirus was going to mean for this planet. And you stated with, with, with absolutely with absolute certainty that the panic, the panic surrounding the, the virus itself, the, you, you take the, the physical threat to humanity, how many people this is going to kill, this virus is going to kill, you compare that to the economic fallout from this panic, uh, over 
that, there is no comparison. Uh, and this is exactly what has gotten me in so much trouble. So uh, where are you? So that was six weeks ago. Do you still agree that the panic is what is going to bring us into the collapse of uh, civilization and quite possibly the extinction of our species? Well, the panic part only accelerates. That's only an accelerant. <laughs> uh, the, the reality is that whether it goes slow or fast, uh, the, the outcome is inevitable. We will, we will uh, have money disappear. Money will have no value at some point. And when that happens, not if, but when it happens, uh, no one has any uh, incentive to produce food or to distribute it to the cities. That's going to be the problem. Now, as far as the, the uh, virus, yeah, I think uh, in retrospect, maybe what we should have done, maybe, I don't know, I don't, you know, don't quote me on this one, I'm just giving you a maybe here. Uh, maybe what we should have done is let, uh, let the virus kill whoever it kills and don't, don't mess with the economy. By messing with the economy, I think we, we did it worse. You, you know, <laughs> we added uh, insult to injury there, you know, and uh, I think we, we made a big, we put, uh, we, we, we put at risk 8 billion people for a few thousands that might die, even a million. I'll, I'll even concede a few million. But it, it probably would have been better for a few million to die and not to put the economy at risk where 8 billion are now at risk. <laughs> Amen, brother. I'm just going to let you dig this hole for both of us. Uh, this, this, this breath of fresh air floating out of... Bill Gady probably doesn't get complimented for the breath of fresh air floating out of his mouth. Uh, but thank you is all I can say from the few of us out here uh, who agree with you. So you think clearly... The uh, the cure was, is, uh, is is worse than the, the disease. disease. Yeah. The, the there's disease, no question yeah. in your. There's well, no question well, look at your something, mind. Sam. Look at something, Sam. You had the uh, 1918 flu, a uh, Spanish flu. Yeah. It killed millions. They uh, they say it killed millions. Okay, that's the history wreck. Let's assume that's true. If it killed millions, here we are. We we're all still here, right? That means that yeah, it killed a, a a big percentage of humanity, probably more than this virus did, and uh, the world kept ro uh, you know and, rolling forward. And there were but, one fourth as many people. We, we're yeah. in a surrealistic situation where everybody's at home wearing masks when they go out into the streets. I'm not, and, uh, <laughs> and, and a lot of people are not even working. And so I don't know, you know, I don't know if the, again, if the uh, cure was worse than the disease in this case. Uh, okay, and I, I, I have always been using Sub-Saharan Africa as my poster child for the, uh, for the collapse of a planet. You know, since day one, I have been telling people, if you want to see the future of this planet, uh, go over to Sub-Saharan Africa. So when you're sitting here in what I call Honkyville, uh, over here in the U.S. or Europe or Australia, and, 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 you know, in one of these, quote, first world economies, your theory that you're positing sounds a little bit more absurd. I think it would have a lot more relevance. It would play a lot better in sub-Saharan Africa. So what I'm seeing in sub-Saharan Africa right now, brother, are, are, are you seeing the same thing that we have had now... 70% of Africa is under the age of 30, which is a terrifying enough statistic without the coronavirus. So here we have 70% of that population under the age of 30, and anyone who studied the death uh, rates of coronavirus knows how many people under 30 are even going to get sick of this. So we have now locked down... Pull a number out of your hat. 300 million sub-Saharan Africans are being forced to stay in their homes to, to, to protect them from getting a virus that has a 99.99% survival rate for people under the, uh, uh, under the age of 50. Uh, they're not allowed to go out and work to make money to buy food. The, their money has been killed, as you say. It has been removed. They do not have a way to make money. 
do the math. Mm-hmm. Uh, are, are, are you seeing that, that this is an absolute r- r- ridiculous? So now, in, instead of those people, uh, in order to protect them from this virus, hundreds of millions of people on this planet who, who would never have gotten it or would have shrugged it right off are now looking at starvation. Yeah. Uh, in fact, you're, you're going to have uh, that situation in many countries, not only in in Africa, but probably in so- in Southeast Asia yeah, and yeah. Uh, South America. Uh, you know, a lot of people can't afford not to go to work. <laughs> even even if you sell drugs on the streets, you, you know, you, you're making a living somehow. And, you know, that guy's off the, off the streets now. He's going to have problems as well. So everybody, I mean, in Colombia, you have these prostitutes. They, they all... There's like two thousand of them uh, in a, in a, some kind of union, and they're they're upset because they say, "Look, you know, you're forcing me to stay at home. Um, I, I, how am I supposed to make a living if I don't do my my stuff?" You know. And so you, there's a lot of jobs out there that people have. Again, a lot of service jobs, uh, trade, etc. That were unemployment, but we didn't recognize them as such until now because we say, "Oh, look." Uh, this prostitute, she's not doing her stuff anymore. And this drug seller, he's not doing his stuff anymore. And all these people were living off of, you know, whatever they were living off. <laughs> and now they can't because now they, there's no people on the streets, first of all. And second, they got to stay at home as well. Now, I'm go- I am going to debate you on the prostitution part uh, <laughs> because I-, I have a very good friend. Her, her business is called Happy Ending Massage. And... <laughs> <laughs> and she tells me her business is booming. That she, because of all of these stressed out guys, including doctors here and uh, including physicians here in Austin, Texas, she is uh, assuring me because so few people in her line of work are, are still, they're, they're so terrified. Uh, her business is absolutely booming. Uh, so they yeah, I'm actually, talking about right that are on the streets, you know, it's a little different out there in Bogota and in Buenos <laughs> Aires, for example. Yeah, not, not, not a whole lot of people driving, not a lot of Johns driving down the street, but uh, I, I, I mean, to get, you know, to get a little more uh, serious here, do you think, it, it, it seems to me at this point, uh, what are we, two, just call it two months into this madness, it seems to me, Bill, that a lot more people are, in fact, by orders of magnitude, I think a lot more people uh, are going to starve to death, particularly people under the age of 50. By orders of magnitude, you're going to see more people starve to death on this planet uh, in the next year than uh, would ever have uh, died from uh, the coronavirus. Do you agree with me, or am I just getting carried away? Well, uh, the question is whether that's going to happen uh, in the advanced nations, because uh, uh, you, you can't talk about people starving to death in Europe, in, yeah, yeah. Uh, in the United States. You know, it, it just doesn't... <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm talking the, the that, but you know, world. I was talking to Germans here, and uh, a long time ago, about 10 years ago, and I was t- uh, asking them, look, do you think we'll ever have those soup kitchens again here in Germany, you know, where, where people came with a little plate and, and they give them, a, you know, a, a spoonful of uh, soup? And they all laughed. They said, no, it'll never happen again. That, that's gone. That's history. And I think we're going to see that again somewhere somewhere in the States and uh, maybe in Japan, Europe. You know, you're going to see this. Uh, okay, but, but, but get, getting back to the, quote, developing world, uh, let, let's, go, let's go over there before we come back over to Honkyville. Uh, okay. Do you agree with me uh, that more people are going to starve uh, than would have died of the virus if we'd let it burn, baby burn? Well, yeah, I think, for example, I can give you an example of Argentina, you yeah. know, uh, you know, I'm in Argentine as well, and I'm German and, and Argentine, and uh, down there, they're having problems with labor right now, very big problems. One of the issues is that the unions have decided to cut their own pay, and that's on top of the fact that the government also flooded the market with, with money, with pesos, 
And so we have a, the, that situation that I was telling you, the devaluation of the coin. And that's one issue. But then what happens to all those people who were, uh, you know, peripheral? You know, they, they, they were not really into the economy full time. They were like uh, just hanging in there. Well, yeah, those people, I think, are going to have problems surviving. And there's going to be one or two possibilities. Either they starve to death or they're going to go out there with a gun and do some justice. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, well, so, yeah, certainly, when, you know, when you track this, the, 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 and the, at least the environmentalists who are being honest about this, and it's unbelievable how people don't want to hear this, that, the, the, that it just tracks where the most biodiverse, uh, you know, gardens of Eden left on this planet are in the very, uh, you know, in the very places where people are most likely going to be facing starvation, which gets us into the, uh, our fellow earthlings uh, heading into the stew pot. And, and, and I see, at least for Sub-Saharan Africa, the next great megafaunal, you know, I- any mammal uh, over, uh, over the size of a gerbil, uh, and, and probably the gerbils too. Uh, they so, say that that happened in the days of the dinosaurs, that anything bigger than a cat did not survive. Yeah, yeah. I think humans weren't we about the size of a shrew. Uh, <laughs> that's how we squeak, literally squeak through it is because uh, we were about the size of a postage stamp and, and we could dive under a rock or whatever during during those uh, tumultuous years. But anyway, let's move it over to, because obviously I don't think I have many listeners to this uh, interview in Sub-Saharan Africa. I actually have a couple of <laughs> subscribers from Sub, but believe it or not that I actually do have some subscribers from Sub-Saharan Africa, although I've probably lost them. Uh, but let's look at our let, let, let's look at the first world the, the people who are listening to this uh, and, and are still sitting there smugly believing that uh, that we're doing this right that we need to do everything we can to keep one more human to you know that limiting the number of human deaths by this uh, virus, we need to make that our number one priority and uh, above all else, keep these uh, lockdowns, whatever it takes to uh, keep the number of human deaths down. What do you say to, to that gang uh, of people defending, vehemently defending uh, the, these economic lockdowns to to tamp down the number of actual humans dying from this virus. What's your message to that crowd? Well, again, I think uh, it was a bad decision to lock people down, in other words, to mess around with the economy to stop this virus. I think that's, uh, I wouldn't have done it. If, uh, I would have preferred that more millions of people die, if, if necessary, millions, but don't mess with the economy. That's one issue. The other issue is, uh, you know, my theory says that no matter what we do, we cannot stop extinction. Okay, so there's nothing we can yeah. do to to um, to overcome the extinction. We we cannot surpass it. We're we're gonna die. No doubt, no doubt about it. In my mind. And so, uh, you know, when people mention, oh, the Illuminati or the Jews or or the rich people, you know, the Chinese are gonna take over. When they say all this stuff. Uh, at least that has nothing to do with my theory. I want to clarify that. <laughs> uh, this is going to happen no matter what. There's nothing we can do about this. Now, uh, mm-hmm. as far as the virus, well, that's something we could have done uh, differently. We could have let people die. Let's say 10 million people died. Okay, so 10 million is unfortunate. 10 million people would have died. But at least we didn't mess with the economy. And the economy is the bigger danger because now you're affecting the lives of 8 billion people. And like you said... Uh, a lot of people are not even going to get infected. A lot of people who do get infected, uh, they might survive, maybe two-thirds at least. And so, you know, the uh, the chances of dying are really small, relatively small. Does it overwhelm uh, medical facilities? Yes. 
Uh, but, you know, like in Ecuador, they're just burning the bodies in the streets and yeah. dumping them in a mass grave. So, you know, I mean, if, if you can't save the guy, what are you going to do? Well, I mean, it, 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 it sounds cold-hearted, you know. I mean, yeah. of course, I'm just being accused of being just this absolute cold-hearted, cold-hearted monster. <laughs> but I, I'm, just, I'm looking at this from an ecologist's point of view that, you know, we're clearly... Uh, there, there's too many people on this planet, but this is uh, uh, this this is not going to trim that. It's not going to affect in, in, any of, of the, the human population. That, that every every day uh, we add more people to this planet than have died in the in the last two months. But anyway, let's talk about unemployment. <clears throat> we um, are at I think. I'm hearing today with the newest figures, 30 million Americans. Now, I know you don't live in the U.S., but, but, but you, you're probably familiar enough, and you can probably extrapolate yeah. to Germany. 30 million Americans have been put out of work, their lives ruined, uh, because, what, 60,000 people have died, 30 million Americans uh, out of work today. Yeah, and I think that's the numbers say, uh, speak for themselves. <laughs> so what does it mean? I mean, this is clearly your unemployment economy uh, has taken a, a, a major leap forward. Is it, 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 is it going to be 50 million Americans next uh, next month? Or, or are we going to get out of this one and figure out a way to get people back to work? Or, 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 or has the cliff, have we gone over the cliff? But, well, I, I think we've gone over the cliff. Uh, it's, not very, it's not very easy to put 30 million people to work. And the only way you can put them into, into jobs is not going to be in manufacturing or agriculture. It's going to be into services, which again is putting them into unemployment in, in a certain way, except that they get paid by private companies instead of by the government. But when you have 30 million, that's a big number. Uh, that's uh, uh, around 15% of the U.S. Uh, worker um, uh, labor force, right? And so that's a big number. And, uh, you know, you can't put those people to work in, in, uh, in a jiffy. And uh, again, like I said earlier, uh, the, the politicians are going to act as cheerleaders after uh, this thing is over and people go back to work, so to speak, uh, partly because they have an election this year. So that's going to be they need to be cheerleaders. They say, look, we, we beat it now. Please vote for me again. And we're going to go go back to work. But see, uh, the cheerleading is not going to put people to work. Yeah. Okay. In order to get people to work, you're going to have to uh, ramp up, you're going to crank up again the hotels. The, uh, the airlines, you know, and so many other things that have died now. And I'm not sure you're going to be able to do that just, just by cheerleading. You're going to have to do something else. You're going to have to do investment, uh, you know, and, and I'm not sure you're going to be able to recover those 30 million uh, very quickly, first of all, and second, maybe ever. Uh, well, you, you can't argue with that. So let's talk about now... Uh, where is, uh, you know, it's like every time I turn around, uh, the, the U.S. government is throwing another trillion, two trillion dollars at the problem. They just keep throwing more and more money at the problem and telling all these people, we're just going to send you all of this money. Uh, how does this play into it? Where, where the hell are all of these trillions of dollars coming from? I thought this the entire economy was 20 trillion dollars. Hell, where, where are we at? But over three trillion dollars that we found. That's that's three twelve three out of twenty is what is whatever that percentage is. Where the hell is this money coming from, Bill? That they're well, throwing at this? It's coming from God. In God we <laughs> trust, right? Uh, but but this is this is the issue, Sam. The issue is the following, and you can see it here very clearly. Uh, why doesn't the U.S. government, for example, right, give every person a million dollars? There you go. I mean, I, like I that mean, that, that, that would solve all our problems. It, it would solve all your problems, right? It would solve <laughs> my problems real quick, brother. 
But what's I the mean, problem? The fact, that, the fact that the government just creates money out of the magic wand shows <laughs> you that that money is worthless that they're creating because all they're doing by, by doing so is devaluating the average worker's salary. The salary of that worker suddenly went down. Uh, he got a he got a, a demotion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but and nobody's so you talking about doing, this. You can't, you can't continue giving two trillion dollars to people uh, to to cover the hole. You know, uh, uh, you can't do that because the more money you put into circulation, the less. Uh, a worker makes, and that means that more and more workers will not be able to make it to the end of the month, especially if they have, you know, minimum wage. And then, and uh, of course, some of the politicians propose raising the minimum wage, but by doing so, what are they doing? They're also devaluating the money. <laughs> well, and, but, but people are still screaming, and, and, and I'm talking about on the uh, what used to be called the left in this country, uh, le- leading the charge, but on both sides of the political fence, we're still hearing calls for more and more, th- just throw more money at it, just keep throwing money, and I'm thinking, man, I want to be uh, working at that, where all of this money shoveling <laughs> Uh, is uh, but, no, but what is this doing to our national debt? Where where is this? The, where is it going to end? Where is the debt to GDP ratio uh, going to be a year from now? If, if we, and of course, we're getting a hell of a what nobody's talking about is, is the tax revenues. The, the tax re- as all of this, you know, at the same time they're printing all this money, the tax the, the money coming in. It is not coming in anymore. Uh, yeah. First of all, they're not collecting taxes. They're postponing the taxes. That means uh, the government's going to be suffering from that point of view. Then they're creating money on the other <laughs> side. Then they're low, uh, raising the minimum wage. Uh, so they're, they're taking all these decisions because it's these these are short term short term um, uh, you know solutions. In other words, they're they're plugging the boat. That's got holes. They're plugging, plugging them with bubble gum. That's what they're doing. And uh, you can't just continue plugging holes with bubble gum. The boat is going to sink at some point. <laughs> you, you can't, you know. And and so this is this is where the problem is. The problem is uh, that you can't just throw money at the problem and say, oh, uh, we're going to solve this problem at least momentarily, and that's just throwing money at the problem. And you can't do that because all you're doing is devaluating the uh, workers' salaries. That's all you're doing. And, and, and so th- this problem is, is only going to get uh, worse and worse. Clearly. Well, it's going to get worse because of this, uh, Sam. There's another issue. When you have less uh, disposable income, you don't buy Chinese products. There you go. And that means the Chinese don't sell. They have to kick people out of their companies, yeah. right? And so it, it's, it affects the global economy as well because people don't have disposable income to spend on stuff. Uh, they won't buy more cars. They won't buy houses, you know, especially big, big, uh, pricey items, right? And so, you know, a lot of industries are going to go under. They're going to have to kick people out into the streets. That's going to increase the uh, unemployment rate, the official unemployment rate. And so, you know, it, it, the whole thing is intertwined. When you move a domino here, the one on the other end also falls. And obviously, the main domino we're looking at, and, and we're already seeing, the, you know, these. So we're, we're on, on one hand, we're, we're seeing right here in this country. Did you see that? That the <coughs> pictures from San Antonio, Texas, two weeks ago. That line of cars going to the food bank. The the pressure on food banks is exploding at the same time that they're they're not getting any food. Uh, because, as you say, the, 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 we're, we're already seeing farmers plowing under uh, food. And food is being left unharvested. They're plowing, and they're literally, right now as we're speaking, they're, they're plowing under uh, food. Uh, and, and what was our two million chickens? Uh, with just one, one uh, poultry company in the U.S., Last week, did just killed. Two, they, they use the word depopulate. We depopulated by two million chickens. I mean, everywhere you turn, <laughs> there's more no, people you, looking for. You got something else, Sam, and that's the the issue that uh, you you wonder because ask yourself the following: Why, when when the coronavirus hit and everybody was uh, said to you know was uh, was asked to stay at home or forced to stay at home? 
why did uh, the uh, food suddenly uh, deplete from the supermarket? Why did all the toilet paper disappear? Well, because people stocked up massively. Hell and the yeah. question is, why did they stock up? Well, because everybody, you know, more or less who's rational says, hey, you know, these are bad times. Just in case, I'm going to stock up. And so everybody went to the food market, started buying everything they could find. And, and now, you know, uh, you know th th this was not replaced fast enough. And so now you don't have any capitalism. What you have is communism. You have ration. Uh, for example, here in Germany, you're not allowed to buy more than two packets of uh, flour, of uh, rice, of whatever, of uh, um, spaghetti or yeah, whatever, yeah. because, uh, you know, it, it's only two, two packages per person. And so, so you go from this capitalist system where you would say, hey, you know, this, this should be an, ad some entrepreneur should take advantage of this and produce, you know, more food. That's not what's happening. Instead, they went to communism. They said, let's ration all this. Uh, let's give only two packages per person. And, we're and, and that also more, is going to, yeah. that's going to limit sales as well. There's going to have an impact on sales. We're going to be seeing more of that. Okay. Here in our last few minutes, uh, of, uh, of this interview. So, okay, by some miracle, some miracle, some hocus pocus species of new bubble gum and scotch tape we come up with uh, in, in the next few weeks or months, we actually, and I, I know I'm suspending disbelief, is that the uh, word for what <laughs> I'm doing here? We actually get through this one. And, and, and things get, at least on the surface, patched back up. Everyone is going back to the beach and to the movies and whatnot. Brother, you and I both know that uh, if, if, the, if the corona panic doesn't get us, if something on this level of threat has thrown this uh, planet into such disarray, when, when the, the big kahuna gets here, as you were talking about, that this is a dress rehearsal for uh, for what's coming down the pike. Uh, just because if we do survive this, when they, it, should, what what does that mean? Is it all, the best we can call this is a dress rehearsal for the one that really does take us over the cliff? Yeah, what this is going to do is uh, grind us, uh, maybe gradually, hopefully gradually. Uh, you know, hopefully it takes uh, uh, years and not weeks. Uh, taking us to the precipice, to the uh, uh, abysm, you know, and and at some point there's going to be a point of no return. And so, yeah, we're going to be playing around with the economy for probably the next few months. But uh, getting 26 million people or 30 million people now back to work, one issue. The other issue is uh, the devaluation of the coinage. In other words, uh, uh, you know, uh, money is not going to be worth as much. And, uh, and then there's going to be the issue of uh, purchasing. You know, uh, all these countries, all of them, rely on um, sales abroad, in other words, on international commerce. And so the United States is not going to buy as much from China. China is not going to buy as much from the U.S., et cetera, et cetera. That's going to cause an impact on, ind on local industries in each country. So, so the, all, the, all of this is so intertwined that, uh, you know, I don't even think we have a computer to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So when, when we really do get uh, to the edge of this uh, cliff, when we do go over and, and this whole thing comes down, how long is that going to take uh, b b before we are really screwed uh, as as a species and, and, and just as an order of mammals on this planet. Uh, is this going to take two weeks, or is your cliff, from the top of the cliff to the bottom, is it two weeks, two years, or 20 years? No, no, no. Uh, that's going to be weeks, no doubt about that. And let me tell you why. Uh, once we reach the edge of the cliff, it means that at that point, money is no more. That means suddenly, suddenly people realize that they can't use money to buy anything, especially what yeah. they need, which is food. And so at that point, you, whatever you got in your fridge, that's how that's a measure that's of how it. much time you have to live. Yeah. Or, you know, so so once we hit the edge of the cliff, that's it. Uh, that's going to be weeks. There we you go. Any other way. 
Uh, listen to this man. I did to my own peril. I did not listen to this man. Uh, two and a half years ago, I shrugged him off as just kind of a character. Uh, but I, I listened to Bill Gady. I, 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 I'm paying this man because you called it, brother. You called it more than anybody I have ever entered. You called this more than any ecologist, any climatologist, any biologist. You, brother, 200 people I have interviewed, you called it, you called the corona panic better than anybody else out there. And I'm not going to make the uh, mistake of not listening to Bill Gady anymore. But <laughs> Bill Gady, we would... Uh, the the uh, civilization is getting ready to collapse on this camera. So for the <laughs> final time until Collapse Chronicles comes back on the air, which might not be ever, this could be the last time I ever ask this question. Bill Gady, if you were not talking to Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles where you could run your crazy mouth for an hour, but you actually had the mainstream media stick a, a microphone in front of your face and say, Bill Gady, give us the 60-second message to the planet on May 1st, 2020, what would your 60-second soundbite sound like? Well, we don't have too long to go. I, I saw a little banner today from a, uh, a strike or people who were out on the street and said, our future is in our hands. And I say, no way. The future is not in our hands. The future uh, was already predicted uh, a few years ago. And that's that, you know, our economy cannot grow forever. When the economy comes to a stop, money is no more. And when money is no more, food is no more. And when food is no more, humans are no more. And there you go. When food is no more, humans are no more. Like every other uh, uh, extinction uh, before us. But Bill Gady, we have got to, right, as much as it breaks my heart, we have got to wrap this up. So guys, you can find... Bill's got a whole bunch of different websites. He's got his own YouTube channel. He's all over the place. and uh, So get over there and find more from this man. But right now, stick around there for a minute, Bill, after we hang up. But guys, okay. what can I say? It has been fun. Two years, two years I did this. And I don't know when I will be back. Uh, but if you enjoyed my final Collapse Chronicles interview for the foreseeable future, please give Bill uh, some love and give him a thumbs up. And if you did not enjoy this conversation, uh, give Bill and Sam Mitchell a big uh, resounding thumbs down that you did not want. You don't want to hear this. <laughs> anyway, that is your choice. But guys, thanks for listening. And Bill Gady, we really appreciate you coming here for an hour. And more importantly, we appreciate the hard, lonely struggle to try to speak truth to power that you're to your great own personal disadvantage. And Bill Gady, keep up the good fight. <laughs> Can you say bye or something? Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Sam. And I, hope, and I hope to see you again in Chronicles. Okay, we, let's stick around for just a minute. Well, anyway, guys, I don't know. Uh, this might be the last time you ever hear me say this. Bye, guys.